saying yes, the other half say no. So we respect the uh, author's uh, choice. Uh, so, so normally for published work that people are more open, uh, and for unpublished work, of course, uh, I think you leave to the speaker's choice. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Okay, so I could not see your screen now, maybe. Oh, you can't? I think uh, I'm still sharing. Oh, uh, let me see. Is it my problem? Uh, you can reshare. Uh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, it's, it's, it was my problem. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, okay, let's get started. Um, it's, it's a really, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Margot uh, Rieger speaking uh, in our webinar from University of Alberta. So, uh, although this is a seminar at the Sujan University, but we ran a seminar from away, so it's more like chatting with your friends on <laughs> night or very early morning in, in Alberta. So, <laughs> So, so, uh, so we will run in a little bit of special way. And so instead of I introduce you, Margo, you could introduce <laughs> yourself a little bit. Uh, sure. Well, well, I, I know some part of it, uh, uh, we cross over with each other many years ago, uh, um, uh, including the university too, like Minnesota, Alberta, I said yeah. Alberta applied before, Minnesota you applied before. So it's an interesting crossover, but you could talk more about yourself. Okay. Sure, okay, so. Yeah, I appreciate the, the invite and the opportunity to share with you guys today. Um, so I'm currently at the University of Alberta, where I just finished my PhD. Um, and most of what I've worked on is has been in some way related to uh, my interest in the cycling of volatiles throughout Earth's mantle and also the creation of cratons. Uh, so I work with uh, Dr. Graham Pearson and Thomas Stockwell here at the University of Alberta. Um, yeah, and so today I'm going to be presenting some work that uh, my co-authors and I recently published, which is related to the deep carbon cycle and what diamonds can tell us about that cycling. Um, and since I'm not, you know, we may have people from different backgrounds, I'm really going to do my best to give a robust introduction uh, to this topic. <clears throat> And so uh, to begin with, I wanna first introduce the deep carbon cycle, which has been of interest to geochemists for a number of, a number of years now. And I think this sort of theme can be well summed up in a couple of illustrations that was produced, that were produced by Plank and Manning in their 2019 Nature Review. And in particular, on the, let me see if I can get a pointer. On the illustration on the left, I think really describes a lot uh, the most important processes um, in this in this elemental cycle, and that includes the the take up of carbon in various lithologies within the slab, including the sedimentary, crustal, and mantle unit, and then some of the subsequent processes that seek to liberate carbon from this subducting slab. So these processes can include things like the mechanical removal of some lithologies, perhaps the formation of some accretionary wedges at the convergent margin in addition to some later chemical uh, reactions such as metamorphic decarbonation and, and perhaps some devolatilization and melting reactions that can uh, liberate carbon from the slab and transport it into the overlying, uh, into the surrounding convecting mantle. And one final important process is that subsequent transfer of that carbon through the lithosphere and back out into um, various volcanic eruptions and emissions, um, which will event, which uh, serves the purpose of, of completing the cycle and bringing carbon back to the surface of Earth's planet. And so if this, uh, uh, and so this sort of sub-arc cycling of carbon uh, is believed to operate on time scales of tens of millions of years. <clears throat> and if this sort of, uh, recycling was 100% efficient, such that all of the carbon that was introduced into the mantle was subsequently exhaled at these various volcanic centers, uh, we would expect these three processes to be the sole processes in the deep carbon cycle. And so for a while, people have been trying to quantify whether or not this is the case, whether or not this, this cycle is in balance. And they do this by comparing the amount of carbon being input into the mantle um, by these various slab lithologies 
to the amount of carbon being output at these various volcanic centers. And so this figure on the left is Planck and Manning's attempt to quantify this using the analogy of a scale of a, of a balance, balancing these two uh, inputs and outputs. <clears throat> And the first thing you'll probably notice um, in regards to this figure is that some of these estimates have extremely large errors, which is simply due to the fact uh, the difficulty of estimating global um, elemental fluxes. But because of these uncertainties, um, some people have come to differing conclusions about whether or not this, this cycle is in balance. And in particular, a number of people have suggested that perhaps we are inputting more carbon into the mantle than is being exhaled at these various volcanic centers. And so this sort of imbalance leads to our final process that we need to consider in the deep carbon cycle, which is, of course, this, the, the transfer and storage of carbon um, in the deep mantle by subducting slabs called deep sequestration. And so thanks to some of the work that's that geophysics have done, we know that these slabs can potentially transport carbon not only to the transition zone, but to potentially deeper into the lower mantle. <clears throat> and this is really important because what this process is essentially doing is removing carbon from the subarc cycling and sequestering it for longer, ge geologically longer periods of time. And so that really introduces the, the, the topic of the deep carbon cycle, but it doesn't really tell you why we care about that. And for that, I want to quickly run through some of the potential and also the deep storage of carbon in Earth's, in Earth's mantle. And so the first implication I want to discuss is probably the most intuitive one, which is simply the fact, uh, the effect that CO2 has, of, has on Earth's climate. And so we're all too familiar, and, and one, a smart way that I think you can sort of think about this problem is to use an analogy that Full Angel School introduced in 2016, where they compared Earth to its sister planet Venus. And while we're all too familiar with the, the concentrations of CO2 that we find in Earth's atmosphere, it is, and, and it might be a bit too high for our liking, it is still substantially less, thankfully, than the amount of CO2 found on Venus. And this, of course, has had some major implications to do with the runaway greenhouse effect that's occurred on Venus, as well as the inhospitable climate. <clears throat> but what I thought was interesting was the Full Angel School's estimate for the effective amount of CO2 that is found on Earth as a whole. So not only including its atmosphere, but also including some carbonates and crust lithologies, as well as the carbon stored in Earth's deep mantle. <clears throat> and the number they came up with is essentially equivalent to the amount of CO2 found in Venus's atmosphere. <clears throat> and so this suggests that Earth must have a really efficient means of regulating its atmospheric CO2, CO2 content. And a part of that system, of that regulatory system, is of course this, this storage of carbon in Earth's mantle. So, uh, the deep carbon cycle not only affects Earth's climate, it might also have affected one of the, the greatest changes in Earth's atmospheric chemistry. And here I'm talking about something called the Great Oxidation Event. And on this figure, it's shown as this uh, blue, light blue shaded region. And it refers to this sudden increase in oxygen that occurred at the end of the Archean. And this, this increase in oxygen has been a topic of much discussion because you might um, see that it does not essentially, it does not exactly align with the evolution of photosynthetic organisms. And in fact, there appears to be some delay between the evolution of these oxygen producing organisms and this net increase in Earth's oxygen content. And so this delay has led some people to suggest that perhaps not only do we need the, the evolution of of oxygen producing organisms to increase, to produce this net increase in oxygen, but we might also need a decrease in some of the sinks of oxygen that we find on our surface. And one important sink of oxygen that we see on our surface are reduced forms of organic carbon. And so what Duncan and Descapta in 2016 suggest is that perhaps uh, the onset of subduction around this time allowed for the deep burial of some of these reduced forms of organic carbon, which allowed for the, this net increase in Earth's O2 content. And so 
And once again, we see the deep carbon cycle, the, the deep subduction of carbon affecting important, um, important processes and evolutionary um, events on Earth's surface. And the final implication I'm going to briefly mention is simply the fact that oxidized forms of carbon influence the melting temperature of Earth's mantle quite dramatically. And for example, here I've thrown up a figure by Duncan and Hirschman, Dasgupta and, and Hirschman in 20, 2006, where they discuss the potential impact that the presence of carbonates underneath um, have on some of the deeper melting that occurs at these, at these volcanic centers. So altogether, the deep carbon cycle has a really important impact, not only on the evolution of Earth's surface, but on the evolution and production of magma from um, our mantle, from the mantle. But as I discussed earlier, we still have these major uncertainties in the carbon cycle. And one way by which people have suggested we can better understand the carbon cycle is to study the solid form of carbon at deep, <clears throat> that is, that is present at high pressures and temperatures. And of course, here I'm talking about diamonds. And thankfully, and luckily for us, diamonds are really um, a well-studied subject. In fact, back in the 1960s, one of the paradigms of, of diamond geology was already established, and that's something called Clifford's Rule, which was simply the observation that Clifford and his co-authors made and that you tend to find diamonds solely in areas that overlie ancient portions of continental crust. And so to call those ancient portions of continental crust cratons, and you can see these regions outlined in orange. And luckily for us, these cratons also experience this type of magmatism called kimberlitic magmatism, which is able to bring these samples up to Earth's surface with relatively little alteration, um, and so that we can study them and, and study them and their, their chemistry, which represents some of the chemistry of Earth's deep mantle. Okay, so another, another way you can, you can think about Clifford's rule is to look at this illustration shown here, where you can see this diamond forming window of Earth's cratonic mantle shown here. And you can see the reason that diamonds are able to be stable in this region of the mantle is because of the graphite diamond transition is elevated at the low temperatures that you find within cratonic mantle. And often in the diamond literature, you'll hear people assigning um, diamonds to a, to, to a specific paragenesis. You'll often hear talk of a, a P-type or peridotite paragenesis or an E-type or equigitic type paragenesis. And this is simply us determining what host rock this diamond was formed in. And because two of the most common types of lithologies in the cratonic mantle are peridotite and equigite, most diamonds can be assigned to one or the other of this paragenesis. And so while these, these types of diamonds that form in the lithospheric mantle, according to Clifford's rule, um, are the, constitute the vast majority of all diamonds that you find in kimberlitic uh, deposits, there is some proportion, some percentage of diamonds that appear to be derived from a distinct portion of Earth's mantle. And specifically, they appear to come from a deeper portion of Earth's mantle. And while some people suggest that perhaps these, these non- uh, lithospheric diamonds constitute maybe 10% of the total diamond population and any to any specific uh, deposit. Others suggest that these are represent only less than 1% 1, 1 of all diamonds. And so as you can tell, they're, they're very rare um, and, and very interesting to study. And we call these types of diamonds sublithospheric or sometimes if you're feeling more creative, super deep diamonds. And so this same figure shows uh, the formation of super deep diamonds um, in this uh, box that I've outlined here. And I think this figure also illustrates a really important fact regarding super deep diamonds, and that is the fact that they tend to be associated with subducting slabs. And there are a couple of what I would say are more famous types of super deep diamonds. And this includes not only blue diamonds, uh, which are, are very, very rare and quite valuable, um, and have this, this blue hue due to some 
boron substitutions within their carbon lattice, as well as these types of diamonds that have been termed clipper diamonds, where clipper is an acronym that refers to some of the features of this diamond, <clears throat> including its resorbed, resorbed morphology, um, its lack of inclusions, and its especially its very large size. And so these diamonds are some of the most valuable stones that are recovered from kimberlitic deposits, and there's a lot of interest in them, not only because they represent a scientifically different portion of the mantle that is otherwise inaccessible, but also because they are quite valuable and people want to know how to recover more of these samples. So the deposit we're going to be talking about today is the Can Can deposit, which is found in Guinea in West Africa. And uh, luckily for us, this deposit includes not only diamonds from the lithosphere, but also two types of diamonds from the sublithospheric mantle, two types of super deep diamonds. And what work has been done on the kimberlites from this region, um, which is actually an alluvial deposit, suggests that the kimberlites erupted in the Jurassic. So I've uh, plotted the, the location of this deposit on a plate reconstruction for around that time, and then also drawn in a subduction center that we think was operating off the coast of Pangaea at this time, which of course will be important for the formation of the super deep diamonds at Can Can. So when we look at the diamonds from Can Can, what we see is fairly typical for all diamonds worldwide from uh, lithospheric uh, origin. In particular, you see these, these beautiful types of diamonds that have these octahedral shapes, um, which is uh, a, a feature you'll commonly see in other lithospheric diamonds. And then the mineral inclusions within these lithospheric diamonds are going to be, once again, typical of your ecogitic or prototitic pyrogenesis. So you'll see these beautiful inclusions of quinopyroxene in eclogite, um, and then some of these red-purple garnets in some P-type diamonds. <clears throat> However, as I promised, there's also a suite of super, two suites of super deep diamonds at Can Can. The first of which um, are a, a population of diamonds that have garnet inclusions with a majoritic component. And simply this majoritic component is an excess in silicon due to the dissolution of clinopyroxene and, and other pyroxenes into the garnet structure. And if you look at some estimates of the modal mineralogy of Earth's mantle in varying lithologies, what you'll see is that majorite shown here is a super important part of any of most lithologies in the transition zone. So here is a, a basaltic lithology. You can see that majorite makes up maybe 80% of the rock in the transition zone. <clears throat> And major deck garnets are by no means exclusive to the Can Can deposit. They've also been documented in diamonds from a variety of, of kimberlites worldwide. <clears throat> but for the purpose of this study, we'll focus on three of the most important uh, producers of major deck garnet inclusions. And that includes our Can Can deposit, as well as the Juina deposit in Brazil and the Jagers Fontaine Jagers deposit in South Africa. Okay, but the final uh, population of diamonds we need to consider are a suite of diamonds and the Can Can deposit that appear to be derived from the lower mantle. And so these diamonds have a really unique morphology in that they're extremely resorbed. You can see here there's really no original uh, diamond shape. We don't know exactly what this the original diamond uh, morphology was and instead we just have this, these very rounded edges. <clears throat> In addition, the, the mineral inclusions that you see within these diamonds are, are quite unique also. Often you'll see abundant inclusions of something called ferropericlase, which is the second most common mineral in the lower mantle, <clears throat> in association with this phase that I'm going to call retrogress bridgmanite. And so bridgmanite is, of course, the most common mineral in the lower mantle and is simply made up of the chemical formula MgSiO3. But the reason I'm calling this phase retrogress bridgmanite is because simply when we find these minerals, these inclusions at atmospheric conditions, atmospheric pressures and temperatures, they have transitioned to their low pressure polymorph, which is orthopyroxene and cetate. 
<clears throat> and so the fact that we find these, these minerals as their lower pressure polymorph and not as a high pressure phase that um, maintains its perovskite structure has caused some controversy about whether or not these diamonds are in fact from the lower mantle. However, I of course am, am of the opinion that they are indeed from the lower mantle and I'll give you a few um, of the reasons why I think this is the case. <clears throat> okay, so the first uh, line of evidence I want to present is simply the fact that these retrogress Bridgmanite inclusions have a distinctive chemistry from orthopragosine from the upper mantle. And so in this figure, we're plotting uh, these retrogress Bridgmanite from Kane Can and some other uh, regions um, compared um, and with their nickel content compared to um, inclusions of orthopyroxene from the upper mantle. And you can see that these retrogress bridgmanite have a much lower nickel content that is indicative of their coexistence with this ferropericles phase, which preferentially partitions nickel into its structure. In addition, we can look at some of the um, iron and magnesium partitioning between these two inclusions and compare that to some estimates derived from experimental, uh, experimental charges. And what we see essentially is that the Mg number of these two inclusions is more or less characteristic of uh, a, a lower mantle with a pyrolytic assemblage that has an Mg number of around 90. And also specific to the CanCan um, retrogress Bridgmanites, are these relatively low aluminum contents. And we think this can tell us something about where in the lower mantle these, these uh, diamonds are actually forming. Because if you remember, um, the 660 kilometer discontinuity is mainly dominated by this transition from ringwoodite to bridgmanite, both of which are relatively aluminum poor, at least at the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary. And bridgmanite only uh, gets its a very aluminum rich chemistry after the decomposition of aluminum rich majorite into bridgmanite. So based on the low aluminum contents seen in the CanCan diamonds, retrogress bridgmanite, we think we are sampling a, a region of the lower mantle that is very close to the 660 kilometer discontinuity. And so if we zoom out, what we have here at CanCan is a really interesting cross-section of Roos mantle, where we have samples from not only the lithosphere, but also the transition zone and lower mantle. And so this gives us an opportunity to examine how carbon moves throughout Earth's mantle. Okay, and so the, the way in which we just, just decided to uh, uh, approach the study was to look at some of the stable isotopic compositions of not only the diamonds but also their mineral inclusions. And so in, in diamond geology, obtaining carbon and nitrogen isotopic signatures of the diamond lattice is a really quite uh, traditional and, and um, a really quite common at this point. And for the non-geochemists out here, these um, results will be presented in delta notation where you're simply um, showing the, the signature of your sample compared to that of a standard. However, somewhat less traditionally, we also managed to obtain some oxygen isotopic analyses on some of the mineral inclusions themselves. Okay, so as I said to the carbon and nitrogen, delta, delta 13C and delta 15N measurements of diamond are quite common and therefore we have a really robust data set that we can draw some conclusions from. And so what uh, generally you can see in these figures is simply that prototype type diamonds tend to have an isotopic composition that is very similar to mid-ocean ridge basalt or the general convecting mantle. Whereas aggregatic diamonds have a much wider range in a stable isotopic composition. This is generally interpreted to the fact that aggregatic diamonds must have some form of subducted component in their diamond forming medium. And typically what people will do is to simply say, oh, the, the, the more positive delta 13C values must be derived from carbonate and the more negative delta 13C values must be formed from these reduced forms of organic carbon that you find in sedimentary units. 
However, one important fact that is often overlooked and which was presented by Ken Lee in his 2019 paper is that carbonate in the subducting slab itself actually has a very large range in delta 13 C that ranges and his values ranges from around minus 20 all the way up to plus five. So really the, the entire range of delta 13 C values that you see in aquagitic diamonds could be assigned solely to carbonate. As I mentioned, we also looked at some of the oxygen isotopes. Um, and while oxygen isotopic measurements of, of mineral inclusions in diamonds are somewhat limited, we do have a really robust data set for our other types of mantle rocks. And this includes not only ophiolites, which are supposedly represent ancient pieces of oceanic lithosphere, but also from mineral separates from echolite xenoliths. And so what you can see on this figure here is that both of these samples appear to have delta 18 o values that are much wider than the range of convecting mantle, which is shown here in this gray bar. And once again, this is assigned to the presence of a subducted component. And the somewhat greater range that you sometimes see in ophiolites compared to aggregate xenoliths, I would say is, is just simply due to the fact that ophiolites are typically analyzed in a whole rock analysis where you may be um, incorporating other minerals such as 18 enriched carbonate, whereas eclogitic xenoliths are analyzed in mineral separates in situ. And so what we did in this project was to take our various diamonds and their inclusions to the 1280 ion probe at the University of Alberta to get some isotopic measurements. And so on this figure here, I'm showing um, the oxygen isotopic signatures of these mineral inclusions versus their depth of origin. And so we want to first fo focus on the lithospheric diamonds, which are shown up here. And so what we found here was very typical. We found uh, prototytic garnets in the, in the purple that have values with an error of mid-ocean ridge basalts, whereas our echolytic ones have a much wider range in delta 18 out. That is, once again, indicative of their subducted origin. However, the question remains, what piece of a subducting slab are we talking about? Where is the carbon actually being sourced from? And for this, I want to briefly look at the carbon and nitrogen isotopic systematics of the worldwide population of eclogetic diamonds, which are shown here in the green. And simply, I just want to draw your, your eye to the fact that over 80% of all eclogetic diamonds appear to have a negative delta 15n value. And this is somewhat, somewhat in contrast to the values you see in sediments, which are exclusively positive, and more in line with the range you see in altered oceanic crust. So with this information, we think carbon, um, the, the formation of diamonds is mostly dominated by carbon that is brought to Earth's mantle by altered oceanic crust and not sediment. And so following other researchers, we think a likely mode of diamond formation involves a metasomatic infiltration of various cratonic mantle lithologies to produce diamond. And so things get a bit more interesting as we move deeper into the mantle, specifically to the asthenosphere, deep asthenosphere and transition zone, transition zone, where we have these diamonds with majoritic garnet inclusions. And what we see um, here is that the delta 18 values that we obtained from these minerals are relatively elevated and range from around 9 to 11 per mil. And um, there are actually two other localities in which major garnets have been analyzed for their delta 18 values, and that includes the Juina deposit and the Jagers Fontaine deposit. And so if we compile all of these delta 18 values and put them in a histogram in the gray here and compare them to inclusions of eclogitic garnet from the lithosphere in the green, what we see is that major garnets have a distinct mode and range of delta 18 values that is much more elevated than that of eclogitic garnet. And this is somewhat surprising because some of the values we're measuring here are actually quite rare in bulk samples of oceanic lithosphere. And instead, we suggest that perhaps this 18O enriched values that we see in major Arctic garnet is associated with a high percentage of carbonate in 18O enriched carbonate and this diamond forming medium. And so I want to briefly 
go into the formation of majoritic garnets a bit more. So for this, we need to look at some of the major element chemistry of majoritic garnets. Because what people have determined using um, experimental charges is that majoritic garnets appear to form via different uh, substitution schemes and, and in depending on the lithology. So as I said before, this majoritic component is simply an excess in silicon. And so obviously with this in excess of silicon, we need to do some charge balancing. And uh, what people have seen is that in ecligitic lithologies, this um, excess silicon is actually charge balanced by sodium, whereas in prototytic lithologies, that is not the case, there's no sodium. So we can actually plot these sorts of substitution schemes on this figure of silicon uh, on x-axis versus divalent cations, where this, this ecligitic substitution scheme is shown here in the, in the blue and the prototytic is shown here in the red. And if we plot our majoritic garnet inclusions from these three localities, what we see is that the vast majority of them don't actually fall on these lines. And instead, a lot of them, in particular the can-can inclusions, fall between these two end-member substitution schemes. <clears throat> And in 2016, Kate Kasiva suggested that we um, name this intermediate chemistry that we see in majoritic garnets, that we name it metaperoxinitic, which is simply referring to its intermediate chemistry. And this sort of intermediate chemistry is interesting to us because when we look at the oxygen, the oxygen isotopic values of some of our majoritic garnets compared to their um, major element components, what we see is an apparent mixing trend between an 18 0 enriched uh, end member and that of, uh, of an end member that looks more like convecting mantle. And so with this information we believe that a reasonable method of formation of these diamonds is to invoke the, the melting of a carbonated basaltic piece of a slab to produce carbonatitic melt, which is 18 0 enriched due to the presence of high amounts of carbonate. And what experiments have shown is that the interaction of carbonatitic malt with the surrounding reduced mantle will actually precipitate diamond. Okay, so the final population of diamonds we need to consider are these lower mantle diamonds that have these inclusions of retrogress bridgmanite. And when we analyze these retrogress bridgmanite phases for the delta 18O, what we found is that these values were within error of convecting mantle, which was actually somewhat surprising, um, given that, as I said before, the vast majority of super deep diamonds appear to be associated with a subducting slab. And this association between subduction and super deep diamonds is likely because diamond itself is often not stable in the deep convecting mantle. And this is because at pressures greater than 8 GPA, people think that um, metal iron will actually be present. And since carbon is, is quite siderophile, it will actually prefer to bind to these iron, um, iron metals and alloys instead of uh, forming diamond. And so on this figure on the left, what you can see is they're plotting the metallic iron content versus the carbon concentration. And so for the lower mantle, we think there's around one weight percent iron. And so you can see for any reasonable estimate of the, the concentration of carbon in the mantle, diamond is not stable. And instead, carbon will be dissolved within these iron nickel alloys or form these iron carbides. And so in order for us to form these lower mantle can, -can diamonds, we need to do one of two things. We either need to increase the carbon concentration here on the x-axis, and we can do this by introducing slab-derived carbonates. However, we know that this is likely not the case due to their stable isotopic signatures, which solely invoke the convecting mantle. And the second way we could form lower mantle diamonds is simply by destabilizing these iron metals or iron car carbides in order to liberate this carbon stored in these phases um, for subsequent diamond formation. And this type of, of model is actually interesting because we do have a mechanism by which we could destabilize these iron metals. And that involves the release of water from a final stage of dehydration in the subducting slab. 
So there have been a couple of people that have suggested that the uppermost lower mantle is an important uh, region of slab dehydration. And this is because you're often moving from this sort of hydrous um, region in the transition zone where ringwoodite is stable that can have a large amount of water to the lower mantle where very, where very few phases are able to store significant amounts of water. And so on this figure I'm plotting some of the, the most hydrous phases that you find in Earth's mantle. <clears throat> and that um, specifically they're called dense hydrous magnesium silicates. And what I'm showing is simply that at typical slab pressures and temperatures, you're often going to move out of the stability of these phases at the uppermost lower mantle. And some people have suggested that this release of water after the destabilization of these phases may allow for some deep-seated melting um, in these regions. And Schmidt in 2014 actually suggested that perhaps you could see some seismic evidence for this dehydration-induced melting in the uppermost lower mantle. And so with this model, we suggest that the, the final dehydration of slabs in the uppermost lower mantle can destabilize these iron metals in order to produce these carbon-rich fluids, which can then later be oxidized to diamond upon ascent. And so if we summarize what we've learned so far, what we see at the Cancun region is apparently evidence for three distinct zones of diamond, modes of diamond formation in Earth's mantle, where we have the metasomatism of cratons in the lithosphere producing diamonds. We have the, the, the melting of basaltic carbonate rich slabs in the transition zone to produce these carbonatitic melts. And, and then we have this uh, dehydration of slabs, um, which mobilizes primordial carbon stored in iron metals in the lower mantle. And this sort of extreme transition from the transition zone to the lower mantle where we appear to have significant um, impact of, of slab derived carbonate in the transition zone and apparent lack of slab derived carbonate in the lower mantle caught our attention because it actually corresponds to some previous experimental evidence that invokes uh, that suggests that perhaps slabs are relatively carbon depleted after they go through this, this region of melting in the transition zone and enter the lower mantle. So we suggest that this, this major change in, in diamond formation that occurs between the transition zone and lower mantle may in fact be sampling this so-called barrier for carbon subduction. Okay, so if we once again zoom out and make some generalizations about maybe what we're seeing here is that we can suggest that perhaps um, a lot of uh, the carbon stored in sedimentary units of a subducting slab are going to be released in the upper mantle where they will cycle through this shallow subarc system. However, that some carbon stored in basaltic and prototitic units of a subducting slab may be able to uh, penetrate into the deeper mantle. And, and, and be stored and, and for these geologically longer periods of time. However, even the carbon in these slabs will be um, released um, in the transition zone for the, for the basaltic lithologies. And we do have some preliminary evidence that suggests that even carbon stored in prototite will be mobilized due to the final dehydration of some of these slabs. And so I think Peter Kellerman probably had it mostly correct when he suggested that what, most, what carbon goes down mostly comes up. Because if we remember, the, the, the majority of carbon entering a subduction system is held in this sedimentary unit, which is going to be recycled through these shallower, um, the shallower subarc uh, cycle. However, I would suggest that perhaps there could be an addendum to this title that, su that suggests that carbon, some, at least some carbon in uh, the basaltic and prototitic units of a subducting slab may be able to penetrate the lower mantle into the deeper mantle to form the diamonds we see here. And so that is all I have for you today. Okay, great. Thank you, Marco. Now it's time for questions. And for the audience who will ask a question, please let us know your name and your institution. So go ahead.
Oh, okay. Uh, let me ask you uh, first half the question. Um, uh, f from the very basics. So for this set of minerals that is still uh, described in your publication that it doesn't contain any uh, rainwoodite, for example, and then you uh, characterize them as from the transition zone according to the nitrogen content, uh, if I remember correctly. And I think it's similar for uh, the previous publication in the Timmerman paper too. So is it the common strategy in the super deep diamonds community that when the silicate inclusions is absent, then we use the nitrogen content to say that they are from the uh, transition zone or, or deep. Yeah, so um, for the for the major at granites, uh, you, there's actually a number of barometers. If, if there is a, a made, an inclusion of major at granite, you can use barometers which correlate the, the silica content of those majoritic garnets to the depth of formation um, because you'll be dissolving more and more pyroxene so your silica content is going to be going up with depth but definitely the the nitrogen the low nitrogen contents of super deep diamonds is is a potential giveaway that you have super deep diamonds however i, I don't think anyone would suggest that if you find a diamond that is is low in nitrogen that you can immediately assign it to a super deep um, Paragenesis, um, because there are there are diamonds from the lithosphere that have low nitrogen contents, um, and and really you do need mineral inclusions or some further study uh, to. Sometimes you can see some dislocation networks, which might be indicative of a super deep diamond, but I would say that hasn't been definitively proven yet. Uh, okay, another relevant question to this is that how, how could this one location that sample both the lower mantle transition zone and the upper mantle diamond? So what's the dynamic process that brought them together? Do, 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 do you, um, I had a conversation with Graham many years ago. I remember yeah. that's why he said that and now he, at that time he thought that, that this was brought by the Kimberlite that generated a uh, Kimberlite melt that originated from the transition zone. Uh, that provide the samples are relatively fast. So do you agree with that? Or do you still think of the Amanda convection that brought this diamonds to much shallower depth before they were finally captured by the Kimberley? So what is your view on it? Yeah, I, I mean, I could be convinced either way, I guess, but a mantle convection is so, I would expect so slow, you might have, I mean, the fact is some of these diamonds do so, show significant resorption. <laughs> So, um, but they have, but what has been done on dating of super deep diamonds suggests that they do come up, they do form at around the, the Kimberlite eruption age. So they're not, they're not ancient. Um, so they need to be transported relatively quickly up um, to the surface. And there, I mean, Graham does have a recent paper where he's suggesting that the majority of Kimberlites do have a, have a primitive mantle origin uh, based on their hafnium and neodymium isotopes. And this would suggest that, you know, this, this place where kimberlites are beginning their initial melting needs to be relatively uncontaminated. And you might expect that would be from somewhere in the lower mantle. Um, so while I think there's a, a lot of experimental evidence suggesting um, while there, there are a lot of papers suggesting that kimberlites come from the upper mantle, I, I do think there is growing evidence based on the, the, the finding of super deep diamonds in, in quite a number of kimberlites now that they may in fact be derived from the transition zone or at least the uppermost lower mantle. So that's a non-answer, I guess, but <laughs> I'm fine with kimberlites coming from the uppermost lower mantle. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for sharing your view. And another uh, relevant question that I have for this is that uh, if you uh, use the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I think chance, uh, chance groups uh, work that to use the uh, hydrogen dehydration process to destabilize as iron, um, to, so that iron could be uh, consumed. So if you use this model that does that also, that's it. Uh, does this mean that the primordial 
uh, signature uh, is uh, for this uh, the, the lower mantle diamonds that are in your samples. Uh, uh, should they still keep a primordial geochemical signature or no? I don't think so, though, if you use this model. I mean, I, so the, the discussion on primordial carbon kind of confuses me because, I mean, there should be a whole mantle convection. So I don't know if really there's any primordial mantle signature anymore. Um, but this sort of model I'm, I'm pre suggesting I would maintain oxygen and carbon isotopic signatures that are relatively similar to the general convecting mantle because you're not really introducing that much water and water itself doesn't have that much oxygen. So your oxygen isotopic signature wouldn't be affected by this, wouldn't be significantly affected by this introduction of water. Um, and your carbon isotope wouldn't as well because the majority of your, your carbon would be lost in the transition zone. So while I'm not sure it's, if it's maintaining a, you know, a, the, the extreme primordial composition that we expect to have been present at the beginning, you know, the, the creation of our planet, it, it is maintaining a convecting mantle origin, if that makes sense. Okay, so, so for this sample, so you don't expect to have a very, very high helium-3, helium-4 ratio either. Oof. Um, not necessarily no not not necessarily because it's we're not we're not necessarily yeah talking about um this primitive mantle we're, we're just talking about the the general convecting mantle i mean yeah it would be it would be fun if they did but i don't see why they should okay uh, 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 uh well my comment that i see uh, another possibility for a clipper, which um, is that uh, actually this is part of my last publication, 2019 EPSL, that yeah. we, we argue that for the iron iron carbon binary that people normally use uh, for the deep carbon, uh, let's say for the real system, uh, we should also consider nickel and sulfur. So it's like uh, it's, it's like a multi um, elemental. Uh, equilibrium under the deep mantle uh, that yeah. will determine that how much carbon could be stored in, in the different phases if, uh, as a carbonate, uh, uh, carbide, or uh, sorry, uh, as carbide or as diamond or as a mouse that with, with this um, uh, like the metallic compositions. So it partly uh, shown that in the clipper diamonds, um, particularly from Ivan Smith's work, uh, yeah. that, 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 that partly works, uh, but probably not exactly in the in your samples that you have shown, in particular that you have got more blue uh, diamonds that is showing more hydro signature. But I don't think they are mutually exclusive though, yeah. because uh, be, be, because for the real system that probably will also look at this metal, carbon, sulfur, hydrogen, for example, uh, uh, let's say depending on, uh, let's say which system it really applies to that we pick up a three or four elements and then look at the phase diagram in that particular uh, uh, PT conditions. So that's just my comment. Uh, I, 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 yeah, the, no, I think I, I, I looked at your work a bit and I, so you, you, you're you um, suggesting that these, these um, iron rich liquids are in the convecting mantle, right? Which is distinct uh, from Vin's model where he has it in the subducting slab or where, where are uh, you envisioning yeah. these? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, from the thermodynamic calculation that we uh, that we performed, uh, yeah, it, it should be uh, let's say in a reduced condition that should should be what it looks like in sure. Earth's interior. If we assume the Earth interior has certain amount of carbon or sulfur, yeah. which we do have, and and the the biggest are difference that we have when we viewing Ivan Smith's diamonds is that uh, if those um, let's say uh, metallic faces were really formed for aclogy, it should not have such high nickel concentration because his okay. nickel, uh, nickel divided by nickel plus iron ratio is about 0 0.2. So it's mm -hmm. too high. So if for aclogy, our calculation suggests that it should be less than 0 0.05 because aclogy is almost uh, nickel free uh, because it doesn't have much olive to equilibrate with it. But the other yeah. way around is not. So, so, so that, 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 that's one of the evidence that we put in. 
Um, but uh, but overall, that um, they, they also have other evidence of that to 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 could say that those metals don't necessarily have to come from the subduction slab. But we just show another alternative uh, that I think is self consistent with the composition of metals yeah. that he I, I do think it's interesting trying to figure out how many different types of super deep diamonds there are because, I mean, I do see some similarities between Evan Smith's Clipper diamonds and the, you know, general super deep diamonds that have a major edit component. <laughs> um, well, because mine don't have abundant iron inclusions. Um, there are some that, that do, and it seems to be this transition from, you know, diamonds that have no metal inclusions that still have major edit components to those that have abundant um, iron inclusions and, and still major edit components. And it would be interesting to see, I mean, no one's going to break apart a clipper diamond, unfortunately, but it would be interesting too <laughs> if someone would to measure the stable isotopic composition of those major edit garnets in those, in those clipper diamonds. Um, because I think that could tell us if, if clipper diamonds are really a distinct formation mechanism or if it's simply an end member of some of this mixing processes that we're having here um mm -hmm. yeah because otherwise we have like a, a bazillion modes of diamond formation in the in the deep mantle which is going to get a bit confusing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay uh, but after all clipper diamonds are very special because grow such big diamonds yeah uh, probably it's not yeah. in a normal type of condition that we're having to come up but okay, uh, especially so deep. I mean, uh, megacris is uh, common in the crustal depth, but not in the mantle though. Okay, so do we have, uh, yeah, sorry, I have taken too long time in asking questions. Uh, so for other audiences, if you have any questions, feel free to open your mic and ask a question. Uh, hi, Margot, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, yeah, I, and I'm Qingbin from Zhenyuan University, and I'm a first-year PhD student. And I'm curious about your, uh, the, I mean, the acetal fractionation. Have you ever uh, considered uh, about the uh, different system, the, the acetal fractionation? Um, so, uh, during these diamond forming processes, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, 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 right, right. Like uh, in the different yeah. system, you know, or like uh, upper mantle or in the uh, transition zone or... Yeah, so I mean, it's really... Uh, people don't have a lot of data to work with in these super deep systems, but um, most work has been done sort of modeling isotopic fractionation in in diamond formation in the cratons. And what people have shown there is that um, typically as the, the diamond is forming from an evolving fluid, you can maybe fractionate um, uh, the, the, the stable isotopic compositions by one or two per mil, but really you can't, you can't go further than that um, within reasonable conditions. Um, so some of these extreme values that we're seeing here, I don't think could be explained solely by isotopic fractionation and, and said need to have the presence of subducted components. Um, and I would expect that to, to be consistent, um, especially the case as you, as you move to higher temperatures um, in the transition zone and lower mantle. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Hello, Margo. Hello. I am Yaman from Gondo Institute of Geochemistry. So I'm curious about one thing. It's work mainly, mainly based on the oxygen isotope of the silicate minerals, right? Yeah. Uh, how about the carbon and nitrogen isotopes? I don't see you talk too much on this. Is yeah, there any true. corresponding relationship or tra tra trend? Um, from um, yeah, so I, I didn't talk too much about it. Um, so I would say 
it's hard to have a, a distinctive signature um, from carbon and nitrogen ice chips. But what you do see is that the range, so these can can diamonds actually have quite positive delta 13C, which is, is quite consistent with our model of carbonate, right? Because your traditional carbonate end member is going to have these more positive end members. And that's what we see in the can can diamonds. Um, but other major diamond bearing diamonds, such as uh, the Jagers Fontana Joina, actually have quite negative delta 13C. Um, which can also be found in carbonate, but some people argue is derived from reduced forms of organic carbon. Um, but what's interesting is that we appear to have consistent delta 18 across between these two end members. So I would argue the more simpler interpretation is simply that, that all major degranates must be derived from this carbonate component. Um, and that maybe there is some sediment in there, but it's not a necessary, necessary uh, piece for the formation of, of these major dike diamonds. Um, the, the, what, the nitrogen isotopic composition on, on super deep diamonds is actually um, fairly limited, and that's due to the fact that these um, super deep diamonds often have very low nitrogen content, so you often can't get an isotopic composition out of them. Um, but there have been a couple couple of samples that have been um, measured and what they show is um, quite positive delta 15N values. And I would say what's, um, it's not distinctive of this model. It doesn't, I would say it doesn't support it, but it doesn't hurt it either because you would expect the uppermost portion of a carbonated basaltic um, slab to be altered such that you would have a more positive delta 15n value. So while I would say that neither carbon and nitrogen um, are especially indicative of this carbonate sort of source, it's not, it doesn't hurt our model in any way. Okay, thank you. So yeah, one, thank you. one more relevant question about the uh, uh, analytical question about nitrogen as well. I, I read your paper on chemical geometry. Okay. So, so uh, what's your advice to uh, get the very high quality nitrogen isotope or concentration for analysis using things? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 totally, <laughs> it, it totally depends. I mean, you need really good vacuum, and unfortunately, and you need what we have here at the at Alberta is this nitrogen cold finger, which, I mean, it seems like you don't want to be adding nitrogen to a vacuum that you're trying to measure nitrogen in, but what it does is it cools everything down and gets your background down. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's, that has been really helpful to measuring some of our super deep diamonds here at Alberta. Um, but as for the, the speciation that you measure, it really depends um on your your sample so for diamond we use cn right um because there's abundant carbon and so that signal is really really strong but yeah i, I don't know <laughs> it's, it's difficult to thank do you. good luck <laughs> thank you thank you yeah yeah because yana now he runs the same lab at the institute of geology the uh, institute of geochemistry in guangzhou so okay. that's why it's pretty Great. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. So do we have? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Yana, do you have more comment? <laughs> no. One more comment. We, we now have a new another things. So if you are interested, you are welcome yeah. to come here. Yeah, that sounds sounds fun. Uh, and nanosims, I've never used. I've I've. Uh, yeah, Arizona State. We had one, but I've, I never really got much practice on it. We have two. Why is the uh, Kamika MS WTHR? It's similar okay. to the habit in another one. Another thing just came here last year. Great. Wow. News. That's fun. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'll have to make a trip. Yeah, after the academic. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much uh, again, Margot, for sharing. And thanks yep. everybody for participating. Okay, have yeah, a good evening, everyone. Yeah, and have a good day, Margot. Yeah, you too.